Great. Uh, thank you all to be here. And uh, good news, you should all have AWS uh, credits in your account. Uh, message us if it's not the case, but we were told that it got um, transferred. Um, be careful with this. Uh, this is only once. So it used to be that we could add more money. Now it's a one time. We highly, highly suggest to not use those credits for development. When you develop your code, use something either Collab or AWS has its own like equivalent of Google Collab. Do this on that uh, platform, it's free. You get a GPU. And then when it's time to run your experiments, maybe on larger data sets, that is the time to use those credits. Also monitor it because it's your credit card that's behind it. So monitor it if you can put some alarm uh, to be sure that you don't go over. Uh, if something happens, it will be you directly contacting AWS to get a reimbursement. So let's try to not have this. But this is a good news. Um, the second thing is I already met with uh, many teams for the uh, projects. I'm super excited by the breadth of the projects. I just want to bring a few high level comments that I end up discussing quite often with the team. So it's probably something on Friday I will also approach. The first one, this is a multimodal machine learning course. Um, so we're really gonna work with you over the next few weeks to be sure that your research ideas are multimodal. So for example, if your idea is, let's do transfer learning and you use a typical machine learning unimodal approach and just apply it on multimodal data, um, that's a good baseline. But I would like to ask you, I'm and the professor in me always wants to push a little bit more, like, like let, let's explore more. I mean, at the end of the day, if what you do is that, that may be okay, but I like to push a little bit and try to think of all the concepts we discussed up to now. We'll have another like two more weeks of like multiple transformers and also RL to try to push it beyond that, try to include really core components of multimodal like alignment, the different type of fusions we discussed, how to look at interaction, all of the above. So this is not a process you have to do by yourself. We are there to help. That's why we have this team of CAs that are gonna meet with you. Um, so this is, a, I, I did a list of all of these. I'm just going to, you can- continue. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so, um, so at the end of the day, we are there to help with the TAs and everything. So uh, this is Mehul, who is a TA, Hello. who will also give the lecture on Tuesday on Vision Transformer. So he's learning the setup here. Okay, so let's all look at Mehul and let's look at ELP now. Okay, <laughs> Mehul is not there, he's the, the Jedi. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, I see. anyway, I will not uh, get on this. So uh, the project, that's the course project. I'm really excited and we're gonna work together on this. The other thing, let me give an update. So this is multimodal transformer. We'll finish a little bit of that. Here, today, we're going to go beyond sequences, start looking at hierarchical modular representation, and then we'll revisit multiple transformer, but also look at computer vision and transformer, and then look at the multimodal extension. And we're super happy to have Jack Hassel give a, a guest lecture on Thursday. OK, so the presentation today, the lecture is about these structured representations. We could have called the last lecture multimodal sequence representation. But now we're gonna start thinking a little bit more about structured representation. And I have to say, this is an ongoing research topic where there's not like one perfect solution that solves all of it. For sequences, we've established transformers are very powerful but for these other representation, there's still work to be done. 
So today I'm going to wrap up a little bit the multimodal sequence transformation transformers uh, by talking about how to use them for sequence to sequence, like uh, if you're doing machine translation, for example. Um, but the, what the core of the lecture will be about going beyond sequences, going uh, to hierarchical, modular, um, and that's really cool term, neurosymbolic, um, which we will learn is just a rebranding of neural module network, but it's a really cool name. So I have to, and we, it is coming again. There was a big peak in 2018, 19 of that research, a little bit more calm uh, the last two years, and we see a regain of that. So that's really exciting. <laughs> so language vision transformers, we talk about the two, the two simple way, the simplest way to do language vision transformer was to put both of them on the same transformer. But as we realize is that then suddenly the matrix for the query suddenly has two jobs and may get a little bit confused when it's a language, uh, the way that it will embed this or the way it will embed the query for the vision may be different. And that's why there were extension, uh, I'm just showing one of these visualization to suddenly start looking as a cross modal. If you remember for here, I want to see how visual information can help the vocal representation. So the vocal representation will be the query or the key. I want to learn a representation where that uh, visually contextualize my vocal. So the vocal is the query. That's, that's what I want. But I want to see, is there anything useful in the visual? The visual are my keys and my values. I'll both. Um, so we, and, and many of the architecture, Wilbert, all of these extension, me, uh, Meteor, uh, no, not Meteor. Um, um, so I just wanted to give this small example because uh, there's a lot of what we've done up to now was what I would call symmetric fusion, where all modalities are made equal, but there are, and I already talked with two teams on Wednesday, where it was clear that one modality was maybe stronger. Stronger maybe because there's more data or stronger because clearly this problem is primarily maybe a language oriented problem and then other modalities are there. So there is some ideas, I just want to bring that one, the, which is the idea that instead of making all equal, you will in fact shift one modality, uh, you will shift. So one primary modality will be used and then the other modality will be shipped. We look at this for fusion and what's interesting is that there was then extension to that uh, for a birth equivalent of that. So the idea here is that the language representation has its transformer and then the other modality, they could have their own transformers if you want, but the other modalities are there to shift and then you continue. So there, the in a sense, your language is your query, and the others will come there as potential to add to it. So you could implement it by simply taking the previous uh, uh, multimodal transformer, the, the cross-modal one, and ignore the others. So you're just saying language is my important one, and I'm just going to see how acoustic and visual can help. That's one way to implement. This one does it in slightly different by a good old style of attention network or, or gating. Uh, so it does it in a slightly different way. But the basic idea is the same. You have one modality and the others is, is uh, adding kind of uh, information to it. Uh, and that's the way they did this in the uh, specific implementation uh, where the shifting so it, they decided to use uh, word also part of the gating originally. I would have put audio and visual only uh, because that's what is supposed to shift. Um, but the idea of adding it also in the decision of what's useful information 
was probably because it's sometimes useful to know what are the words to know what is useful nonverbal information to add. That is the idea. But I believe that instead of doing this way, you could do the approach we saw earlier where you use the query as the language and the keys as the nonverbal. I just want to show two, one more concept and then we'll do the sequence to sequence. These are mostly uh, teasers. There's a lot more literature. I don't have time to discuss all, but there's a very decent amount of, of research on memory for multimodal sequence and memory for sequence in general and memory for multimodal as well. So I really invite you to look at it. Some of it is just marketing. They, they call their uh, latent representation and memory, but some other are closer to cognitive architecture where you have a, a read and a write uh, and explicitly reading in the memory and writing in the memory. Uh, so, so there's different version of that. So this one will say, where I, have I visited previously? So you would like to remember the previous object you have so you'd like to have a memory of the previous object you visited. Um, they implemented it, I will say, in a somewhat a simpler way with a transformer where you mostly, in this case, have a transformer that just accumulate information or memory uh, of what was the most relevant or salient at each point in time. Um, but the interesting part was to go back and do that injection. So I, I yeah, like I, I don't want to go into details of how they exactly implemented it, but you mostly have this recurrent aspect, the recurrent, and I'm going to show this kind of recurrent transformer in a little bit more detail in the next section. So it's almost of a preview. Um, but here, the idea is the memory in all of these, the transformers are all used about contextualizing sample uh, or observation or element with each other. That's a typical uh, transformer. Now, the memory goes a little bit different. They, they implement it so that at t minus one, that t minus one is again an input at t. So they, they're re-updating the memory over and over. Um, that's the idea here. Usually that kind of recurrence is not used for memory. It's often used, and that's what I'm going to present, when you generate text. You all have a little bit of that recurrence as well, a little bit when you generate text. It's implemented differently. But uh, So I invite you to look at this line of research of memory oriented um, to try. Uh, the first, I will say, version of memory was, was here at CMU, a uh, very popular transformer XL, uh, was uh, this probably first one that like accumulated over a longer period of time by, by, by bringing like, because we talk about the chunk has maybe only 100 tokens. What if I have 200 tokens? How do I encode? a 200 token, 200 element sequence. And that's the, the time where uh, this kind of, uh, um, I keeping the first 100 and, and feeding it as an input for the next 100, feeding it as an input for the next 100. That's kind of the idea here as well. Good, um, just a little teaser. Um, the sequence to sequence is, is I want to use transformers. You have to remember, transformer came in and everybody loved recurrent neural networks, uh, LSTM, RNN. We're, we're still like that. That's like the way we think. Uh, and so uh, when we had our models, we really think about it as what my current state is and what my next state will be. That's a very first order kind of Markov chain in a sense, like HMM. So we, we have this mentality of generating one token at the time 
observing data one token at a time. That's the way we've been thinking. So people were like, oh, you bring us a transformer where everything is connected with everything? Wait, 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 I want to do thing one token at a time. And so they did a little bit of trickery to, to replicate this idea of generating one token at a time. Um, so I do not like it, je n'aime pas cela, or je n'aime pas ça. Um, and so how do you do the, uh, how can you generate such a, a sentence? That's the interesting part. The idea is the first step will be a typical transformer here. This, this one is just typical transformer. So every token is embedded. Every token is embedded in a way that it is contextualized by the other token, the other words. So that, that, that this is like the same thing of the last two lectures. Now, the interesting thing is that they suddenly will have both. That, that's a tricky one. And, and so they will have a mask self-attention. So they split at the generation. So you could say this is the encoding and this part is gonna be the decoding. And they, they, they split at the uh, decoding in two steps, saying, what did I generate up to now? And I'm gonna hear what it is. It's a fancy word just to say it's a shorter attention model. It's just a shorter attention model. So I'm gonna contextualize these tokens with each other. That, that's what it is. So these could be one hot of what has been encoded, uh, generated, sorry, generated up to now. And this is just a way to be sure that they contextualize with each other. Now the next one, um, so you could put it in a, a vector format that just because it's gonna help me in a second. But the, the real one, is this one where I'm gonna generate and primarily this is the one I'm really interested. So you could see it almost as a masking, you know, it's a masking where, forget the inside of this because I have a big question for you. In fact, the question is already there, but forget the question for a second. Here you have four inputs, okay? You have four inputs to the transformer and this input will be the equivalent of a mask. I'm not telling you. You know how in masking, what we were in BERT, we were, there is a sentence, and then I mask a token, and I ask you to predict that token based on the context, like distributional hypothesis, okay? That, that's how BERT is uh, here. It's exactly the same thing, but there will be three of them that will be simply these, one, this one will go there, this one will go there, and here will be an empty token. I don't know what is the word, but, and then it will predict something as if it was predicting a training. I know what this should be, so I can check if you predicted correctly the next token. But the big question is, which one is the query, which one is the key? in that transformer. You have two choices, okay. Who vote that this is gonna be the query? Who vote that this would be the query? Okay. Who vote that this would be the query? There, there's only two. <laughs> huh? Okay, who vote that it's both going to be queries? Uh, okay, maybe he knows something I don't know. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so the general idea is I, this is my sentence I'm generating. This is my main task. You remember in the multimodal, I said I want to see what information from vision could be useful for my language. Like I want to visually contextualize my language, but language is my task. This is my goal. So the query is always your, your task, your main goal, your, your things that you're going to have in fact um, 
uh, uh, skip connection. Um, is there? No, I didn't call it skip connection. Re uh, not recursive. Residual. residual. Yes. Okay. So residual connection. So the 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 main task is the one with the residual. Is the one with the query. That's that's the main task. This is my main task. I'm trying to generate things. Now the uh this is like extra information that may inform me on how to do my task, and that's why it is the key and the values. Okay. Query is my information. I have that primary thing. And then the secondary is the key and value that's going to add to it. I'm trying to contextualize it. And there are probably multiple layer of that, uh, really, at the end of the day. Uh, but that's enough. So they called it the encoder, the decoder, the encoder, decoder. I, the naming, I don't, 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 uh, don't have nightmares about it. So, um, but yeah, so that's the general idea of sequence to sequence. Uh, I think uh, these days uh, generation is done a little bit differently. Uh, we don't really need to just generate one token at a time. So there's a lot more different approaches that extended, but this was because we were so used to do one generation of one token at a time, we really wanted to have an equivalent. So I want to go beyond that. Uh, and the most obvious beyond the sequence is to start looking at graphs. Graphs, uh, because when we look at a transformer, it works really well for sequences. But sh uh, should the general idea, the general question that you have to ask yourself, in fact, why should I use a graph versus a transformer? Because in a sense, is the transformer kind of a graph? I mean, the a transformer is a a graph where everything is connected with everything. So, if if anything, if you have enough data and you 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 don't need you don't have any kind of domain knowledge about what could be the structure of your data. Transformer, although we represent them as a sequence, another way to represent transformer will be just almost a point cloud where every point is connected with all other points. This is really what a transformer is. We show them as a sequence because we magically put those positional embedding in it and suddenly they act like a sequence, but literally, the formulation of a transformer is really more of a point cloud almost uh, where everything is connected with everything. So the graph approach will be, hey, what if some nodes were not connected with other ones? What if I have some knowledge about the domain or at least I have an intuition that there is gonna be a structure in my data that's beyond connected everything with everything? And that's the, the, the key of the graph. Um, so there is uh, the simple linear chain. It could be because there is a tree uh, in, in it, uh, but there are graphs, there, there's many reasons you would do a graph. Um, I will say there's a lot of research um, at CMU and outside on social networks. So every node is maybe, um, um, maybe a person in, in the social network. The key aspect of most of them, what, what are the kind of uh, tasks? Let me talk about the task and then the key aspect. But the key aspect first of a graph is, is there's, there's two building blocks, nodes and edges. So nodes, usually it's an entity. And then edges is the kind of a relationship between those entities. That's uh, at the most basic. And what are the kind of goals you will have in a graph um, is that what's really nice, it, it, it can be used uh, to uh, in a supervised learning sense. So you could say you have a graph and for every node, you may have a, a similarity weight with other nodes. And the extreme version is, again, where every node is connected with every other node. 
but then you're back to the transformer. But the, the, you're going to find out that graph neural network is uh, almost a generalization of a transformer in a sense, because but but it, it, it you can definitely represent a transformer within a graph neural network. We'll see about it because you can always decide in a graph neural network to connect every node with every node. And that's definitely something you can do. But one of the tasks in a graph is, which is, I think is interesting, is a, almost of a semi-supervised learning where you have, for some nodes, you have your labels and some other nodes, you may not have the labels and you're kind of wanting to propagate um, this. So, so a classic example also, uh, you could almost uh, do image segmentation in a way uh, that way where you may know some object or seeds and you're slowly rebuilding the uh, segmentation by merging together uh, different uh, sub-segments of it. So um, that, that would be, but in this case is that I have a network and I already annotated some people's being, uh, are they human or bots? So very popular topic on the uh, social network like Twitter and X, uh, like which one is a real human and which one is a bot. Uh, and you have the typical supervised learning way would be just have all these samples. You have a bunch of sample and you said, I already annotated bots and human. But the beauty of this is that you have extra information. There's some similarity on how this person acted. Maybe they are friend or they post in the same kind of channels or they have the same kind of topics. That's the kind of similarity you would like to encode. So this allows you to encode similarity and doesn't need to annotate the whole data set. You only annotate a small subset and hopefully you're gonna to allow to propagate uh, the label to all of the others. So that's an example. Uh, another uh, uh, reason is, is more unsupervised. Another thing you can do is that you can learn an embedding, a similarity embedding between your, uh, so you have, you have all of your sample, and you could try to learn an embedding originally for the network for all of, you remember how we uh, did the alignment between two videos? Do you know how we did the alignment between two videos and you had U and V, the two modalities? So you could have two modalities. And, and in this case, we use consistency to be your last function. But here, I could maybe just have similarity. So you have all my U, you have all my V, you have similarity within the modality, which frame or which word are similar with each other. And then, oh, ten. Uh, and you have also for the other modality, how similar they are with each other. But you may have also similarity at some place, and it's, it, 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 it can be just sparse. So it doesn't mean that every uh, object necessarily has a relationship with every word. So you have your uh, sentence, you have the list of objects. Now you can encode as, as you want, similarity. Some objects have nothing to do with a certain word, that's okay, I have no edge. Or, or maybe the some object has some type, um, then yes, I will. And that can be multidimensional, okay? So similarity could be um, defined over more than one dimension. So they could be similar because they both express the same emotion, they're most the same culture, the same topic. So that's multidimensional. And the similarity matrix is whatever you want. It, it could be KL divergent. It could be something simple as cosine similarity. And so then the problem would be, I want to learn, I give you a bunch of video that maybe have been synchronized with some similarity function. And then I give you the 
question of can you learn an acoustic uh, uh, a language and a vision encoder? So it's representation learning, but representation learning when my input is a graph. So represent, so it's in this case, almost multimodal representation learning for U and V, but the only information I have is a graph. Now, if it's fully connected, you're back to the transformer, okay? But if you're not fully connected, um, uh, or if you're fully connected and you would like something more than a cosine similarity, that may be another reason. Because a lot of these, graph neural network libraries allows you to define similarity function uh, more than just this simple attention. Because if you remember the transformers, most architecture, although now these days, these libraries allow to change a little bit, but that, that basic building block, that attention is, is, is very simple. It's a linear transformation for WQ and WK, like the key and the query, and then just a multiplication. What if you would like something different as your similarity function? So these libraries also allow you a lot more flexibility there. Now, these days, I think you see some of these functionality come also in the transformers where people even use kernels uh, as a similarity function in a transformer, um, but they are not as fast to implement. So that's why um, the graph neural network, the, inf the, the inference is usually a lot slower than transformers. Yeah, yeah. So they, I mean, if it's a video, maybe it's just that similarity could be encoding um, something as simple as their timestamp or distance between timestamp because they like things that are relatively close in time should be uh related to each other but you will need another kind of signal uh, and that probably depends on the problem a signal that gives you some kind of similarity function so at the end of the day you need that similarity function to be defined for your problem um but if you have that and if i understood the question so if you have that similarity function then yes the idea would be to learn a way to uh, encode uh, e each of your samples uh it could be with one encoder. And I gave you the version where there you have a different encoder for each modality, but this exact figure was in fact one encoder for the whole graph. So, sorry, sorry, yeah, I should have mentioned. Here is the same encoder for all nodes, but the example I gave you was already the multimodal version where encoder A, is maybe for all these nodes, and encoder B is for all these nodes. That's the multimodal version of this. Uh, but so if you have these two nodes, you will use the same encoder for these two nodes. Um, but if you have two different nodes, then you will use two different encoders. That if you have two different nodes from two different modalities, then you will different encoders. So that's the multimodal. The version that's on this slide is the unimodal version because that's the same encoder for all nodes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a graph neural network, it's a bunch of uh, nodes, or you could call it a vertex. Um, and then this adjacency matrix, which is mostly all the edges. So nodes, you have nodes and edges, which you could say for edge, the extreme version is every um, every node is connected to every node. In this case, you have edge for everything. You could say you could call these edge, you could associate to it a weight, or you could call it adjacency or like how close they are from each other. That's another terminology for that. Um, and often what's interesting is that you have this graph and usually those nodes are unknown, they're latent. And associated with each of those nodes, you will have an observation. Or you may have an observation only for a subset of those nodes. This is very similar maybe to an HMM, good old fashioned. Like you had a, a Markov chain, you have a Markov chain of random variable, 
and then you have some observation associated. Uh, the difference here is that these will not be a generative model. Um, so uh, the, both the way you model this and the, usually the way you define these are not probabilities, but simply a weight, a score. So in the sense, in that sense, they're a lot closer like to uh, energy model or conditional random field if you uh, played with that at some point. Um, so, but yeah, this is a lot more about similarity weights, which is also related to how uh, the neural networks, the weights of the neural network. And optionally, you can have, uh, for some of your labels, you could have your, uh, for some of your nodes, you could have labels. So you have observation, you have this thing, this latent variables, that's your graph. And then you have optionally, uh, some labels for some of them. That's a typical neural, uh, graphical neural network. And so the beautiful, the next two slides are quite interesting. It took me a while, even myself, when I first look at it, because what I'm really going to do is almost transform the graph into a multi-layer neural network. And that's that's the part that, that that's hard. It's like this, you could say, yes, maybe you could put neurons there, but, but the, the beauty of a graph is that information flows everywhere in the graph. In a sense, this node should have an influence, not just on its neighbors, but it should have an influence also on these and these nodes. So as long as two nodes are connected somehow, they should influence each other. And that influence, that's what is gonna be hard to implement. And that's where the, the key idea of graph neural network is that each layer of the graph neural network, so the, the, the short version is a graph neural network is a multi-layer perceptron at the core, or kind of almost. But the, each layer, are going to be the the idea for each layer will be oh this node has an influence on its direct neighbor that's what the first layer is going to model the second layer will say but that node also have influence on this that has influence on this that's the second layer the third layer will say that node has influence on this on this on this so that the fact that this node has influence all the way to d that F has influence to D, to make it in a neural network, we need at least three layers of the neural network. So the number of layers of your graph neural network, of your neural network that replicates a graph, needs to have a depth that at least the same length as the longest link you have in your graph. You could decide to make it shorter, in which case the influence will be limited because that node, if you made it only two layers, will only influence uh, at this level. So that's a little bit abstract. I'm gonna make it more concrete, but I wanted to give you a first intuition. So the key idea is to generate the node embedding and to, so the, the idea is each node has an influence on some other nodes. And I'm gonna encode that. So randomly, I pick one node, or maybe that's my target node. Um, and the idea here is who else has influence on me? Okay, so I said this has influence on this, but the, the, the other way around, because these are usually uh, both ways, they're symmetric, it's a weight. So it's symmetric at most graphs. So. The way C influence A is the way A influence C is. Uh, so here, A is influenced by these three nodes. So I will say my new A is going to be influenced by these C. So I will want these, in a sense, to contextualize my A. I didn't put the skip connection, but there's one that is implied. So you probably had your A before, and then I'm gonna contextualize it by the other three. 
Okay. There's different way of implementing it, uh, but the the, the more uh, the the one that, that that's quite popular is to have almost an A here, and I'm going to contextualize by uh, the other three to have my new A. And I will create such network in a recursive way. So B has its own B, but it got also influenced what by A and C. C had to be influenced by all the others. So all of these are all contextualization machines. That's what they are. So a graph neural network, and that each of those blocks will be a neural network. Um, you could say it's a mini transformer. Um, and so like that's what this will look. So if I, I have six nodes, each of those nodes will have its own graph of who are its parents in a sense or who are, are its neighbors. And these neighbors will have its own one. Now, that doesn't seem manageable, like because that's, that's going to get wild, crazy to have all this over. The beauty of it is that if you put them, so I'm, I'm just doing this now, and I put it here. If you look at it, each layer is going to look a lot like the other. What I mean by that is yellow. The way yellow is encoded is the same way here, and the same way here, and the same way here. So that's the, the key insight. Although it looks like this, the key insight is I, I don't really have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I do not have 14 neural network at this. If you look carefully, there's only six. There's the yellow, there's the green, the red, the blue, the purple, and the pink. So the same six that are there are also the same six that are there. So instead of drawing it like this, I'm going to draw six here, and I'm going to draw six of them here, and then I'm going to make the connections that are needed to replicate that exact graph. So if yellow was connected with red, yellow is connected to green, yellow is blue, and um, so there's going to be only one of the yellow, but it's going to be connected to red, green, and blue. Okay? So the graph really, it looks crazy like this, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the same exact number of neural network. There's only going to be six of them. And if green was also connected, let's say, to, uh, to red, not just to yellow, green is, so that one will also come here. There will also be a connection there. And then the different layers are just more and more propagation in the graph. So every layer are just propagating information from layers. So, so the first time I'm propagating a kind of a, it's almost first order, and then second order, third order, you're propagating the knowledge more and more. So, so that, that's the main, main thing. There's two things in this, and that's number one. And if you have questions about this, this is important. And then I'm going to try to see what, what's in that box. That's the second uh, thing, what, what's, what's really in that box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so it's definitely a feed-forward neural network. So it's a... Uh, Definitely, in that sense, there is a direction. Um, when I said it's indirected, this link is indirected uh, in the graph. Now I'm going to approximate it with this kind of directed. Um, but I think there's an implicit question that I want to be sure that I answer correctly, um, which is the way C influence B the way the weight of B to C 
will it be the same weight of C to B? And I'm not sure that they end up tying that weight. I'm not sure. You could. Uh, I, I'm not 100% sure if they are, because you could tie the weight from C to B to be the same as B to C. Um, I'm not 100% sure if they are. Um, I, I'm sure people try both empirically and pick the, the one with best performance, in which case then uh, it, it, it becomes not like this, but it becomes double, like two arrows. It's mostly two arrows in that case. So if you don't tie, if you tie these weights, then I think this graph is valid. If you don't tie these weights, then, then it will be two arrows that you end up uh, modeling. Yeah, good question. Uh, there was one and then that, yeah. So, so the, um, the second order uh, of a typical chain, and I, and I probably I should not have said second order because and I often see second order in a, like Markov chain, for example, and and then the second order is that the the next is connected. But if two elements are connected, they're they're going to be connected every layer. So so I should have probably not call it second and first order because it's uh, um I think a, a better name is is when you do belief propagation and if you do graph uh probabilistic uh, uh uh probabilistic graph network like like. Like when you do belief propagation, these beliefs that are propagated, that, that's a little bit more what you're doing here. Um, but if, um, okay, great, good. Uh -huh. After so many. So if you, if I understood your question, um, so first order Markov chain, uh, second order Markov chain, but that's, that's a direct link. So in the first layer here already, this is going to be connected with this. So that's why I, I, I should not have said second order, because if you're really having second order, um, uh, like, and, and the, the, the problem is here, you each of those nodes are going to be part of the network in the uh in in the graph neural network that's um there is extension of a graph neural network that are sequential or temporal but most of them um the basic basic one will just have a a set time window like uh, like the same way we have for a transformer so you have a hundred tokens so if you decided that in your sequence of tokens you will connect always the this one with this one in your adjacency matrix, your huge, huge, huge adjacency matrix, if it's first order, it's just it's just the diagonal. If you're second order, it's it's these two. If it's third order, the and the rest is zeros. Um, does, does it uh, make sense? Yeah. So yeah. So that that that's what's really happening uh, in this case. Yeah. Um. Um. Uh, so as we mentioned, there will be only six networks here. Um, so the number of weights is not going to be really big um, because you will um, um, you you will have uh, maybe up to whatever number of nodes you have in your network come in. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about this uh, in a second. Maybe that will answer this. Uh, what, what the, the, the key answer is that, um, yeah, let, let, me, let me go to talk about this. That will answer. But uh, there is a decision to be made where do you tie the weights between layers? Um, and usually, uh, I don't think they are tied. So you, it's a multi-layer neural network as you have a multi-layer perceptron. So the way, the general idea I see it at least, is the way information will be shared with your neighbors, with your first order neighbor, although uh, I don't know, let's call it first order, but your direct neighbor is, is encoded there. So here you encode direct neighbor influence, and here you, you, uh, 
you encode second neighbor influence. So you could decide to have a different weight on how you encode first layer and second, or you can decide to tie them. Um, I forgot if in the original implementation they tied, I believe they did not. I think each layer was different but there is also nothing stopping you from tying it uh, if you don't have a lot of data, but then your, your model is gonna treat contextualization always the same way from layer to layer and just see it as just propagating the same thing. So, which may be at the end sufficient, yeah. So, um, so we talk about like, is it a share because say CB, is it tied with BC? So we tied that, but what I mostly meant is here I talk it as if there were 13 of them, but really there's only uh, but there's only six of them. So so you could see it as there's 13 with tied weights, or really at the end of the day you just have six of them. So uh, that was what I meant there. Yeah. So the the real implementation I, I was kind of slowly going from that graph to the real one. There's another slide that should be in this where this is exactly the same A. Uh, that's how it is implemented. There's only one A that's connected to all. The same way I said, there's only one encoder for C that is uh, gonna be, um, um, there's only one encoder for C that's gonna be connected to B uh, as well. So the, the, the in the in the previous, I said, oh, for, for, for B, I have another green that's different from this one. But in fact, uh, the same one will be used there as well. Uh, so, so there's only one encoder for C uh, in the sense. And let me go a step further. I believe uh, in most of them, every node will be tied as well, sorry. So uh, the way you encode C, is the same way you encode B. So the reason you end up with B is because you're gonna have a skip connection to the originally to B. But what's in this box is gonna be the same weight as this box, as this box. Okay, I think that's the part that a little bit earlier that I, and that's why it's so similar to a transformer because yeah, transformer, that's how it works is like, as you remember, there's only one set of weights for the query and a weight for the key. And these will all use everywhere. That's the same thing here is the same will be used uh, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So the graph neural network at its core is, a, is, a, is another contextualization machine. Uh, Transformer is a really powerful contextualization machine. This is a contextual mission. Now, what I didn't tell you yet is what's the loss on that. Uh, but the core of the graph is, is going to be contextualizing nodes with other nodes. That's what the core. Now, on top of it, as I mentioned, you could make some uh, loss to start uh, supervised, like try to um, being able to um, uh, uh, so like label the nodes. Maybe you have uh, some nodes that are labeled, some that are not. So, so there's different loss you could add on top, but the core of it is a graph neural network. It's just another really good contextualization, but you have more knowledge about what is connected to what. That's the main difference. Yeah. Uh, recurrent in the multiple layers, it's networks, yeah. They will, uh, and, um, uh, but usually they will be, um, for larger, you, you often have as many layers as you want. In fact, even if the longest link is three, you could decide to have a four or five layers of this. It's just, you're gonna start having more subtle influences because E influences D, but maybe B also influences that influence back E. Uh, I don't know, like this, uh, these kind of, uh, because the more layers you have, the more you kind of have a more long range uh, influence in your graph. That's kind of the way I see it. So how long range you want the influence 
in your graph is how many layers your neural network should have. The transformer doesn't have that issue because every node is connected with every node. So at every layer, you always reach all your other nodes in the transformer. But here, because not every node is connected to all nodes, you the contextualization requires a certain number of layers to go. But the same idea that we had with the transformer, where this is about contextualizing each other, the same basic concept is, is still happening at every layer. It's just that contextualization is more localized. So I don't allow this one at first to be linked with this. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I should probably continue after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how much you will, uh, uh, this is more of a design decision um, uh, on this, is like, do you want the tie the way? The, um, I said by default, this should be uh, symmetric, as I mentioned, but I will show you um, that in a second, um, the way we are computing this. So let me show you how I'm computing this. And that will also maybe clarify this. So because like, yeah, what's in this box here? And so how do I aggregate multiple neighbors? That's kind of the idea. How do I aggregate multiple neighbors? And the key insight is a little bit transformer inspired, is that I I will and I will expect that each neighbor has kind of a position embedding maybe in it. And so that I, I can just, and, and I can almost average them. If you remember the transformer, after doing those dollars attention, just do a simple summation over all the attention time the value, attention time the value, attention time the value. So it's just a summation over all its neighbors. It's just that the transformer is connected with everything. So here, there's different strategies. The original one was simply average pooling. So you're simply taking all of those H uh, and simply uh, averaging it by their weights. So the, the weight matrix is what you're learning and you're just averaging it. Uh, so, and, and, and there's just, uh, the summation is a little bit, um, the, the equation looks weird because they, in their first uh, version, they had a different weight for yourself. So because I said you have that skip connection, probably. And there they said, instead of a skip connection, I'm just going to put a different weight for myself. Uh, and, then I, uh, and then that's for myself. And then for all the others, I'm going to have different weights to that. Now, I, I think there was some, so there is a convolution version uh, where in fact, everybody is kind of is treated the same and you're kind of uh, uh, the same weights can, and that can be efficient. It's almost a um, convolution over all my neighbors in a sense. And there is the closest to the uh, transformer. This is mostly at that point is a graph attention network that is fully connected is exactly a transformer, okay? So here, what you would do is say each, all of them, I simply uh, multiply uh, all of them, but I have an attention related with it. The, the main difference is uh, the, the transformer also has a matrix for the value, like to so the value, and, and but if you add also the residual connection, so there's, there's some small differences uh, architecture-wise, but the spirit of a graph attention network is quite similar to a transformer. So I would like to, really like to go a little bit further. So I, I will skip exactly the, the, the training, uh, but the loss is that you can define different loss over that. One is is maybe because you, are doing some kind of uh, supervised learning where you have the labels and then you could have the labels for some nodes and not other nodes. I, I, I don't wanna 
the, that, that part is not the important. I would like to skip a little bit because I really want to talk about module networks. Um, and so let me just a second uh, go to that because that's uh, hierarchical is, is interesting, but the, the, the interesting one is module network. Um, and I want to be sure that I talk about that. Um, and the general idea is in these transformers, everything is connected to everything, but more importantly, everything is a dense representation, like, like, like very um, uh, non-interpretable dense representation. And, and so if you have knowledge, you could have knowledge because you know certain nodes only are connected with those, but you could have knowledge, more symbolic knowledge. Symbolic knowledge, the one way to think about it, symbolic knowledge is very close to the idea of discretizing your space. You're, you're taking a continuous space and you're making assumption that, that things are, are, are discrete. And, and the neurosymbolic is going to be a mix in the sense of continuous and discrete at a very high level. So I'm going to give you a few examples just to show, make it more concrete. So neural module network was the first one to in that direction. And the basic idea was I have language. That's great. But I also have this extra knowledge about language, which is grammar. I have this grammatical information. And the idea was, can I use this grammatical information to, with some like ad hoc rules, at the beginning it was a little bit ad hoc, uh, I'm going to take this parsing tree and transform it into a computational mod, uh, computation graph. So the beauty of this is that suddenly you will not see language as a sequence. You're going to see language as a graph. And the interesting thing is you're going to have dedicated modules. That's the beauty of module networks, is that you have sort of different types of modules that have different weights and different tasks. And it's somewhat inspired of cognitive architectures where you have some modules that are dedicated. You could say the brain have part of the brain that are dedicated of a certain task and some other part of the brain that's dedicated for another task is loosely inspired of that, very loosely. So um, the, each module will have a specific task, like each module may be tie, have a word, and has an image. And the module is trained to be super efficient at finding that object in the image. So you give it a query, so forget for now all the transformer, okay? If you make a link with transformer, it's uh, so I was debating to talk about module network and a separate, uh, but the, here, this is before transformer. Yeah, 2017, okay? That's, that's transformer. Uh, before BT, after AT, before. Uh, okay, uh, so this is BT, okay? Before transformer. Uh, okay, and so here it's a one layer neural network that is designed, or a CNN, maybe a CNN, that's designed to take as an input a query and find uh, where that object is likely to happen. The idea of module network is that you have many of those specifically designed. Uh, so the, the transformer is learning everything from scratch. That, that's, that's really cool. Here, you're going to go and say, let's forget that for a second. Let's say I want to have dedicated neural networks doing certain tasks. And it's funny because now, these days, with large language model, you, you kind of see it coming back again. Because now, large language model will have all these access to different APIs. And then they will connect 
to different APIs or different modules and, and bring all the information from all these different APIs. Like you see the uh, renaissance a little bit of that neurosymbolic as well. So of modular network uh, in a sense. And so you have all these different neural networks that can give you different tasks and you're gonna find a way to bring them together. The here is that you have different APIs uh, one that's good for different tasks. And then the goal is give me a, a, a big task to do, maybe image captioning. And I'm going to, that, that's now these days, this is an LLM these days, okay? Large language model are extremely good at taking a task and saying like, hey, this would be a good call for this module call for this module um, so but back then it was uh, a rule base and then it became an lstm or recurrent but now these days you will use this and this is mostly a bunch of call to different uh api or networks that you have so you have all these networks that you have available and then what was uh, really cool is that this came just just uh, a year before, but then it was this really cool data set that came out, uh, clever. And, and, and then people were like, I even saw like, like grand proposal written and like, oh, it's gonna probably take years to solve this very hard problem of like, are the equal number of large things and middle spheres, like, like very complex, a uh, question that have subpart to it. You need to solve the subpart to be able to solve the next one, to solve the same. It's very complex. But these questions were not created by human. They were created by a computer by creating these recursive, more and more complex questions. It got solved. It got solved within three months. Okay? Because the module network is wonderful for that because it has that nice structure of module, the subpart that get the subpart that get the subpart, which is a bit of a graph in a sense, but the, it, it, it has it. So, uh, so what was nice is that these really complex knots, if you get the, the correct computation graph, I give you, I give you a question like this, you could probably transform this question into what are the subpart I need to solve first? Oh, I need to find all the middle spheres. Okay, I need to find all the large ones. I need to find the number of each of them. And then I need to find out if they equal to each other. But each task is really simple. It's just a combination of those tasks that's important. Okay. So that that for them, uh, they did a clever err uh, to try uh, even be more clever. Um, and then the the people were like, how do I create that automatically? Uh, people did it with an RNN, uh, um, just a recurrent neural network. Now you will do with the large language model. Um, but the what I liked also is in in this version. All of these computation layouts are predefined. You have a predefined set of what those modules should be uh, or can be. You have it predefined. But what if you would like to learn that as part of your network as well? So you don't, in this version, these computation uh, module already been decided, but the only thing you decide is how to uh, arrange them together so that I can solve that question. Um, so here it was the e first version of it, very initial version of it um, that didn't really completely solve that problem that I said where it's not just about managing modules and finding out how to build a computation graph, but also how to create the modules, the dictionary of modules at the same time. And suddenly this beautiful name came in, Neural Symbolic. So Neural Symbolic is a module network with a much cooler name. But what they did is they say, 
I have many different uh, uh, experts, you could say. A module, in a sense, is an expert uh, or at a certain task. I have previously trained them on different kind of attributes. Um, I, I trained my CNN. And then I have my a large language model that's going to create a nice program. So I know now you're like, yeah, I just asked ChatGPT, did it in two seconds. Okay. But it's cool. At that point, it was really cool. It was the first time that a, literally a program. Not at least first time in multimodal. There was a some work on code generation also, but like so this literally created a program, and from that program, then we were able to say choose which of the CNNs. And the nice thing is, I'm saying the modules are not as in the previous version. There is a module for one task, a module predefined task. Here, the modules kind of have all of these hyperparameters. So you could say, I have a module with that hyperparameter, so, and another module with a different set of hyperparameters. So these two are two different modules. So that's why I'm saying it's a baby step in the direction of learning both the uh, modules at the same time as you're learning how to program them, how to uh, schedule them. Um, so that was a baby step in that version. The last thing I want to describe today is uh, uh, building on that, but doing it in a different manner. So I, I, I like that paper. And I, I just wanted to give you a taste because these days you see those large language model connected to API. And it sounds really cool. They're creating these program. But this this is something that was also tried before, now it's just a lot smoother in the way it does it. That's why I'm saying neurosymbolic is back because the large language model is an extremely good scheduler. Um, so that's really exciting in that sense. So, and it's symbolic in that sense that you have a certain number of experts. That's, that's so if you have a case where you have different expert, different module, you're kind of discretizing. You're not trying to have one neural network that does everything. You're discretizing or that, that skill, that very hard, complex skill, discretizing it in smaller skills, sub-skills. And each of those sub-skills have an expert with it. That's at least the intuition that I can give you. The uh, most of the previous work on module network and neurosymbolic, there is a need of uh, planning and and programming like those modules, and a lot of it was language driven. And these days, all of the one are extremely so the programmer, the coordinator is often language. But I wanted to give you an example where. Vision is the programmer, is the coordinator. I just wanted to give you an example there, where in fact, you're going to look at the image, and the image will be the one giving you a scene graph where the structure of the information is the discretization of the space is going to happen visually. And then there's going to be these more specialized networks that are going to be associated with each of the nodes. So the nodes in this case will be objects in the image, and the graph will be a relationship between these objects in the image. Um, so the first step is to detect all the objects and maybe just use a rule like proximity. So objects that are close to each other gets connected. That's a simple one. Um, so that's all the objects. And then you have transition that could be just because there are flows or there could be a little bit more. It could be because they look the same or because you have another uh, uh, premise that says that uh, certain objects have actions over others. But let's say for now that all of these are your objects. And then what was really cool there um, is that your, your modules, your experts, 
were pre-trained on another uh, data set, visual genome, um, where you train to be able to recognize certain attributes. Um, maybe you're really good at um, uh, for a person to know their mood, or uh, to know the color, to know the shape. So you're 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 having all of these uh, specialized uh classifiers so for certain type of entities so you define the number of uh entities that you will have and maybe the you have a thousand kind of objects so you have a thousand kind of entities you can handle but for each of them you may have also some um different uh attributes mm -hmm. The other way to see it, these are the nouns and these are the adjectives, okay? So the way this was trained, visual genome, it has you have objects with noun phrases associated with objects. The, the young girl, uh, the old man, the like, so, so the nouns are there and uh, these are the adjectives associated. Now I do it here as if it was um, a discrete set, and that's what the original paper was. They had a discrete set of objects, like nouns they could handle, and for each of them, they had a discrete set of, uh, of qualities, of attributes. But the new versions of it, there's nothing that stops you to, to be like free form in this. And what was really cool is for each of them, so this is very discrete. You, you suddenly have an image, and you have all the entities, you run them, it detects which object it is and its quality. And for each of the quality, it has an embedding also associated with it. So you have the neuro symbolic because it's symbolic because it's a description of the image, very discrete. But it also has the uh, neuro because associated with each of those discrete, it has a representation of that object and that quality of the object. And um, so you, in this case, they were manually grouped, as I mentioned, but uh, in that paper, uh, and they had event probability related to that. Uh, the last thing is that now you can suddenly use your language and start traversing into this. Um, and this part, is that you translate each word in a concept-based representation. So you, for every word, you replace them with one of these entities. And then you, in this case, they were doing it as a sequence, but there's nothing that will uh, uh, stop you from doing it as a graph as well. So they were doing it as a sequence. They were taking the question and looking at it as an instruction. Um, so again, there is a there's a there's a, a question, and then you use maybe a large language model to plan the planning itself. So the planning was still done with a large language model, like a recurrent neural network, but what dictated the structure was not the language. What detected the, the dictated the structure was the image. That was the main difference there. Great, so these are the example I wanted to share with you because we see a lot of these these days with large language model and to see where they're coming from and, and what you can do with them. So thank you for your attention and uh, see you next week. We'll have uh, the two guest lectures um, next week. <laughs>